Good morning. It's a privilege to be sharing with you this morning. Uh, Louise and I are enjoying the Northern Rivers. We've been here about six months and we're just loving the place. Uh, it's, we've met lots of lovely people, both in the community and this church, and it's just a, a pleasure to be here. I also know Ros and Daryl Camps from Adra Days, and it's nice to have people that you can connect with as well. As you can see, the title of the message is Apocalyptic Vision and the Neutering of Adventism. Uh, a few words, a few comments on that word neutering. It's not a nice word. Neither is the process pleasant, physical or spiritual. Some will hate the metaphor and some will love it, but none will forget it. And if so, I've achieved the first part of my purpose in using it as part of the title. In 2008, George Knight, a well-known church historian and author, took a series of meetings at a minister's conference in the US. And this was the title. Subsequently, he wrote down his talks. He took three parts, three talks, I think, in a book of the same title for the wider church. And the messages are not just for the clergy, they're for us as well. It's largely the message of the first chapter that I'll be sharing with you this morning. Um, there are six parts. First of all, we'll reflect on the meaning of Adventism. Then we'll look at Adventist or merely Evangelical. And then the third part is the politically incorrect Jesus. The fourth section is an introduction to neutering, then the neutering of Adventism, and finally, Revelation's wake-up call. Just three questions to pose up front. Is it possible that we could be neutering Adventism? And what does it have to do with apocalyptic visions anyway? What might be the implications of this spiritual neutering for us and for the movement. Let's just have another short prayer. Father, we thank you so much that we can discuss things. We thank you for this privilege of worshipping you this morning. We pray that you would suit to each of us the blessing we need. May your spirit guide. Thank you in his name. Amen. To understand where George is coming from, it's important to know some of his background. He wasn't born a Seventh-day Adventist. He wasn't born as a Christian, and his dad had only one theological doctrine, and that's that all Christians were hypocrites. George was converted from agnosticism at the age of 19 in an evangelical crusade in Northern California. As a new convert, George did what many do. He was baptised as an Adventist. He began to look around the church, and he looked at the members, he looked at the clergy, and guess what his conclusion was? What a mess. None of them were perfect. Back in those days, George was working in high construction steel over San Francisco Bay. And one day, up in that rigging, he promised God out loud that he would be the first perfect Christian since Jesus. He was 19 or 20. He had not the slightest doubt that he could do it. All you needed to do, he thought, was try hard enough. Eight years later, three degrees in Adventist theology, a pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, he came to the conclusion that he was still messed up. And the members were still messed up. It didn't work. And so in March 1969, he took out his ministerial credentials, wrote a letter to the conference president, and he resigned from the Seventh-day Adventist ministry. The conference president was a good man. He wanted to, quote, save him for the work. He thought George was having a bad day, but George was having a bad life. And he wanted out. So he took the credentials, put them in an envelope, and sent them off a second time. And at that point, he called George 300 kilometres north, they had a meeting, 
the president handed George back his credentials, had a prayer for George and with George, and George went home and wrote a letter telling the president exactly what he could do with his credentials. And it was George's first literary success. He never saw them again. He was no longer a Seventh-day Adventist minister. He was no longer a Seventh-day Adventist. And he no longer wanted to be a Christian. He just wanted to go back to the ways in which he was raised. For six years, he didn't pray. For six years, he didn't read his Bible. For six years, he wandered in a spiritual far country. It was during those six years that he did his doctoral degree in philosophy and at the end of the six years he came to an interesting conclusion about philosophy that it was bankrupt and it held no answers to life's most basic questions. At about that time George had an experience with his major professor at uni whose name was Joshua Weinstein. Now if your name is Joshua Weinstein and you were born in Jerusalem and you fought in the War of Liberation, you're probably Jewish. And Joshua was not only Jewish, he was an atheistic existentialist Jew. He didn't believe. In fact, every day in class, he would tear religion apart. And then one day Joshua said to George, George, if I wasn't a Jew, I'd be a nobody. George replied, wait a minute, Joshua. You don't even like religion. What do you mean? And he said, you don't understand. If I wasn't a Jew, I'd be one of those millions of people out there. But I belong to the community. They send me off all over the world to be a lecturer. I have significance because I belong to the community. And for the first time, George realised what he should have got from Matthew 13, verses 47 to 49, that there are cultural members in the Adventist church and born again believing members. And those two types of fish, as the text says, swim in the same pond until judgment day. For Joshua, his religious orientation was his life, even though he wasn't a believer. It was his history, his culture, his social location, and he loved and respected it for those reasons. There is such a thing as a cultural Adventist. About that same time, George met his first Bible teacher, the last man in the world he wanted to see. He knew George's spiritual problem. Somebody, I wonder who, invited him to George's house for dinner. He spent an entire day with George and never once mentioned George's spiritual problem. He just exuded an atmosphere of calm assurance in his faith and treated George with kindness and the love of Jesus. And when he left that day, George had met Jesus in the person of his first Bible teacher. That day was George's conversion to Jesus. In 1961, he'd been converted to Adventism, 14 years being an Adventist without being a Christian. In 1975, he met Jesus as his saviour and, as he put it, his Adventism got baptised. If we don't have Jesus, our professed Adventism means nothing. So first comes Jesus, then in the context of a saving relationship with him, Adventism has meaning. Jesus is the centre. Adventism finds meaning in relationship to him. So what are we doing in our ministries, in our personal lives, in our church? Is our profession as Adventists baptised by a relationship with Jesus? Or are we cultural adherents? Or are we born again believers? Let's move on from biography. Adventism or merely Adventist or merely evangelical. Early in 2007, George presented a paper entitled, and the title is complicated, not sure I got it, The Missiological Roots of Adventist Higher Education 
and the ongoing tension of Adventist mission and academic vision. You get all that? It seems as though education and Adventist mission had some tension. The paper was presented to the North American Division Higher Education Conference on Mission. The group was largely made up of college and university vice presidents and presidents and union conference presidents who chaired the boards. George was concerned for the relationship between the academic vision and respectability and the mission of the church. In the question and answer session that followed, George made the point that if Adventism loses its apocalyptic end time vision, it has no reason to exist as a church or as a system of education. I'll repeat that. If Adventism loses its apocalyptic end time vision, it loses its reason to exist either as a church or as a system of education. And in response, one college administrator aggressively stated that what we needed to do was to play down the apocalyptic and instead preach the gospel. George tried to suggest to his brother that, rightly interpreted, apocalyptic is gospel. But the administrator had his views on the topic and getting excited, the administrator stated that his institution was growing rapidly without apocalyptic vision of Adventism or other Adventist baggage. He saw no connection between the apocalypse and the gospel. But he was a practical, successful administrator whose medical arts college of largely non-Seventh-day Adventist students was expanding rapidly in spite of its lack of Adventist focus. He and George were obviously in disagreement, no closure, but the issue had been raised. The next day at the same conference, in an unrelated discussion, the point was made that more and more highly educated Adventist parents were sending their children to non-Adventist evangelical institutions instead of Adventist colleges. And it wasn't explicitly stated, but part of the answer to the problem was obvious. If Seventh-day Adventist institutions are only Christian in the sense that they have Jesus and the evangelical gospel only, then any good evangelical college will do. And with that one stroke, we have removed any compelling reason for Adventist education to exist. Even though they could be said to be good schools, no one could say they are necessary schools. And the same logic, it's important to get this, the same logic works in regard to Adventist churches because really they're two forms of the same ministry. So what is the function of Adventism in the family of churches, in the larger Christian community? That sort of question brings us to the frontier of the issue of why even have a Seventh-day Adventist denomination? And that's probably the most serious question we can ask ourselves today, especially in today's climate with what's happening in the world. What function or use do we have? Is the Seventh-day Adventist church important or necessary? Is it merely another denomination that turns out to be a di bit different than some others? Well, brings up some complex issues related to the very nature of Adventism and the proper balance, an important word, the proper balance between those aspects of our belief system that make us Christian and those that make us distinctly Adventist. Thoughtful people can hardly avoid such questions, especially in the times in which we live. They should probably stand at the centre of our discussion. A balanced Adventism has been at the centre of the historical development of Adventist theology. And yet, sometimes it's hard for us to be balanced. There are some of us who don't like the Adventist part of who we are. We don't want to hear about the Sabbath, especially in the end time context. We don't want to hear about Ellen White. We don't want to hear about the judgment. We don't want to hear about prophecy. We just want to hear about Jesus. On the other hand, there are some of us who groan when we call ourselves evangelical. Think back to the 1888 meetings and Ellen White. She says that we sometimes preach the law 
till we get as dry as the hills of Gilboa. Let us have Jesus. And that's what they needed. Some churches today have preached grace till they get as dry as the hills of Gilboa. They've forgotten the other half of the message. If Ellen White were alive today, she'd say just the opposite. It's not one or the other, it's both and. Grace has no meaning without law. You've got to be saved from something. Just in case that gives the wrong impression, it's not grace versus law, it's grace and law versus sin. Balance between the Christian and the Adventist aspects. But you know what? Balance is difficult. A difficult goal in an unbalanced world. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't seek to be balanced. Now, the politically incorrect Jesus. For his day, he was politically incorrect. Would you agree? It's important to note this because some of us may have a tendency to be politically correct. Jesus not only stated that there was truth, but that he had the truth and that he was the truth and the way and the life and that no one could come to the Father but through him. Jesus stood for something. Jesus, one who unabashedly and fervently stood for something, would not fit well into the 21st century culture, calling people, and particularly religious and political leaders, hypocrites and whitewashed sepulchres full of dead men's bones, is just plainly politically not acceptable. But making such statements was not Jesus' only difficulty. He was also affected with the boldness of his convictions. He so believed in himself and politically his politically incorrect message that he told 12 dirt poor, relatively uneducated men to spread it to the entire world. And that commission staggers normal imagination. But the point is, they did it. Now you don't have to, you don't do those kinds of things without very firm convictions. You don't give your life, your worldly goods, without knowing that you have the truth. If Jesus had been politically correct, if he had lacked the boldness of his convictions, Christianity would probably have existed for a while as a a backwater Jewish sect, and then blended into the Near Eastern woodwork. The point is that early Adventism suffered from the same political incorrectness as Jesus. It believed that it had present truth for its day. It came to believe it had a mission to all the world in spite of its smallness. And in the early part of the 20th century, the various Protestant denominations realised the world mission field, too big, too big. They decided to carve it up amongst themselves. Some countries would be for the Methodists, others would be for the Presbyterians and so on. And they asked the Adventists, what do you want? Do you know what we said? All of it. We had a mission that must go to every tribe and tongue and nation and people right out of the heart of the apocalypse. No, we were not modest. We wanted the whole pie. And you know what? We did it. Because we firmly believed we had a prophetic mission. As a result, there are only two Catholic churches in the world today. The Roman Catholic and the Adventist Catholic. Catholic course means universal and we've gone to the ends of the earth. Why? Because we believed we were not just another denomination, that we had present truth for this time and a commission to take this truth to every nation, every kindred, every tongue and every people. 
Seventh-day Adventism today is the most widespread Protestant church in the history of Christianity. But undergirding that success are some politically incorrect understandings of truth and a boldness of their convictions that reflected on the mission of Adventism. Take George's wife's family, for example, pioneer missionaries to Spain. One brother would be poisoned by the dominant church. His bones lie in Spanish soil. Another brother, his wife's grandfather, his journey reads like the letters of the journeys of the Apostle Paul, stoned, beaten, driven from village to village. What about my generation? What about your generation? Would we do that? You know, it cost these people something. They believed. They had a deep conviction that they had a message right out of the heart of the book of Revelation and that all the world needed to hear before Jesus returned in the clouds of heaven. You don't give up your children. You don't give up your life. You don't give up your money without a firm, firm conviction. Now, I'm being a bit tongue in cheek, just in case you miss it. Uh, Louise said, they don't know you, Kevin. They don't know your sense of humour, so just be careful. And it was good advice. These early Adventists were politically incorrect and suffered from a bit of um, boldness of their conviction. But the good news is that in 2021, we have largely moved on from such primitive and unsophisticated ideas. By and large, the church in the first world has, as George put it, gotten a victory over standing too vigorously for Adventism's biblical principles. We are rich and increased with politically correct assumptions and we have lost the boldness of our convictions that led us to believe we had a message that the whole world must hear. And the result in the first world is shrinkage. When we lost a prophetic understanding of who we are, we began to shrink. In 2008 in North America, it's a long time ago, imagine what it is now, all four racial groups, Caucasian, African American, Hispanic, Asian, native born populations in Adventism were all shrinking. The numbers were going up, but by immigrant growth. We were growing, but it was coming from overseas. The hardest mission field is no longer places we once thought pagan. Oh no, hardest mission fields are where you and I live. We have a mission even there. Some years ago, there was a symposium of a Seventh-day Adventist religion scholars that asked the question, why be a Seventh-day Adventist? These guys were from right to left, the whole spectrum of theology, and all their answers had to do with warm, fuzzy feelings they had about being an Adventist. George's words again. George describes feeling there was not one of those men who said, not one thing did they say that would give him the slightest interest in being an Adventist if he were not one already. When you lose your family, when you lose your job, when you lose your friends, you've got to have some conviction. You've got to have some substance. Do we stand for anything? If we do, is it anything significant? What is it that makes people live for something and die for something? When a church becomes politically correct in all of its claims and it loses a proper amount of the boldness of its convictions, it manages to neuter itself. Even if it continues to brag about how potent it is. Now neutering and self-neutering, by the way, has a long history in the Bible. I'll let you explore that. I'm not certain of all the implications of neutering, but I'm told that it does seem to be one of the more effective ways to stem the tide of productivity. 
And the best example of religious neutering in the modern world is the Protestant liberalism in the 1920s. Protestant liberalism in the 1920s had divested itself of such primitive ideas as the virgin birth, it didn't make sense, Christ's resurrection, the substitutionary atonement, miracles, Jesus' second coming, creation and of course the divinely inspired Bible. Human reason came to the fore and as the place of knowledge, doctrine became unimportant if not distasteful and Jesus morphed from being a saviour who died in our place to being the best of good people, an example worthy of emulation. And in that process, Christianity was largely transported from the realm of religion to that of ethics. With that masterstroke of the human intellect, Protestant liberalism lost its distinctive message, or to put it more graphically, neutered itself. And the eventual result was, again, shrinkage, by the millions from the mainstream churches. Presbyterians, Methodists, Anglican, Disciples of Christ, millions left. The average membership age shot up and of course morale plummeted. The main, mainline disaster spawned a number of influential books. One of the most important was written by a guy called Dean Kelly, Why Conservative Churches Are Growing. And he's quite upfront when he says that the conservative churches are growing because they stand for something. And if, as Kelly suggests, people are going to join a church at all, it's because it represents a special truth and they know it. That is, people are looking for churches who stand over against culture. A church that is convicted enough to believe there is truth and error and that it has the truth. After all, if there's no special truth, why join? And Kelly notes that instead of being a part of liberal Protestantism, people began asking, why not leave? Why stay? And not finding sufficient reason for staying, they made sense out of their lives by leaving in the millions. Tragically, much of the same thing is happening in second third and fourth generation Adventism. Now there's nothing, oh no, the key word for liberal Protestantism in the 1960s was relevance. Be careful of that word relevance. They wanted to be relevant to their culture. However, they proved that the shortest route to irrelevance is mere relevance. After all, who wants to be more of the same? Now there's nothing wrong with being relevant from a biblically Christian perspective, but to be merely relevant is the road to be absorbed into the larger culture. A healthy Christianity of necessity must stand over against the values of a larger culture and hold truths that the larger culture will find, yes, distasteful, distasteful. If you don't think that is true, just try reading the most revolutionary document in the Bible, the Sermon on the Mount. Having said all those things, it should be said that irrelevance is not the answer. We should be standing for things that are not only true, but that have importance for the times in which we live. And on that point, that last point, Adventism can make a contribution to the world. It became strong by proclaiming that it had a prophetic message for our time. And it is that message that will give Adventism strength in both the present and the future. But if we don't, if we are only another Protestant denomination, let's be honest, let's pull up our tent and go home. We cannot escape the dilemma poised between being meaningful or being neutered. There is no middle ground. Those thoughts bring me to the nutrient of Adventism. Modern Adventism is firmly rooted in the apocalyptic visions of Daniel and especially Revelation. There are at least three ways the movement could neuter itself and it seems as though we've probably found them all. The first one is beastly 
preaching. We've had too much of that slant of the apocalypse. At 19 years of age, George Knight experienced beastly preaching when he went to that evangelistic crusade. He loved it. When it got finished, he knew all about the beasts, all about Rome, all about Nebuchadnezzar, all about the 1260 days. Now don't get me wrong, I love those things. And those things are important. But he didn't know anything about the Lord of the beasts. Jesus is the centre of the apocalypse. Jesus is the centre, the Lord of the beasts. It can be too easy for us to get off on the finer points of the apocalyptic and forget the one who makes it meaningful. Ellen White points to the centre when she writes, the sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin in there is a great truth around which all other truths cluster. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated, every truth in the word of God from Genesis to Revelation must be studied in the light that shines from Calvary's cross. And George gave a, a fabulous illustration. In 1968, he was a young evangelist and he held a, a crusade in a small town in Texas, a small Adventist church. There were 12 members. 11 of them were over the ages of 70 and 11 of them, 11 of them were female. And he takes great pains to say that he is got nothing against females, his mother was a female, he's got nothing against older people because he's old now. Good news was 24 people came to that crusade and one lady, a non-Adventist, brought five other non-Adventists, professional people, and they came every night. But halfway through, she came to the door one night and said, George, not coming back tomorrow night. Oh, his ears pricked up. Why was that, he asked. And she said, I don't like your topic. You're going to tell me what I can't do. George thought he had a wonderful topic. Why I don't eat rats, snakes and snails. <laughs> he told her, sister, you come tomorrow night and when you leave, you will say it's the best sermon yet. But that night, as he lay in his bed at the back of the church, he tossed and turned, thinking, what am I going to say? How am I going to present this? And then at 4 a.m. in the morning, boom, it hit him. His message was, God loves you. And because he loves you, he wants you to be happy. And he knows that you're not happy when you're sick. So he's given a few good ideas about how to be happier. And the next day, George got up and preached the love of God. And that God wants us to be as happy as possible. And that he's given us a few suggestions. That lady came out that night and said, Brother Knight, that was the best sermon yet. But it was best for George. It changed how he preached his ministry. Suddenly he realised if you couldn't preach every topic from the perspective of the love of God and the cross of Christ, you didn't have a message. You didn't have a message. Jesus is absolutely central, not only to all of our doctrines, but the apocalypse itself. A few years ago he was preaching in a country in Europe and their instructor in evangelism at the university was saying that Adventist evangelism was to get people adjusted to culture. And George said, no, 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 no. Adventist evangelism, evangelism is to get people maladjusted to culture. It's a conversion experience from a culture that's been judged by the cross to be wanting. It's being maladjusted to a culture that caused violence and illicit sex entertainment. It's been maladjusted to a culture that pays tens of millions of dollars to sportsmen but puts a primary school teacher on a starvation wage. That's sick. Jesus is the centre of the apocalypse. He's the Alpha and Omega. In chapters 1 to 3, he's the Lord of the churches wandering among the lampstands. In chapters 4 and 5, he's the Lamb found worthy because he shed his blood to ransom humans. But he's also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Chapter 6, he's the lamb seated on the throne. In chapter 12, he's the babe who rose up to be the lamb who conquered the dragon through his blood. In chapter 14, he's the one coming in the clouds of heaven to reap the earth. But in chapter 19, 
He's the King of kings and Lord of lords, riding on a white horse, bringing salvation and glory to his followers. Method number one for neutering Adventism in the apocalypse is beastly preaching and teaching and Bible study. Preaching that fails to put Jesus and the love of God at the centre of every message. Apocalyptic, rightly understood, is gospel. Now the second and third ways to neuter Adventism are both related to Jesus and who he is at, at the centre of John's apocalyptic vision. Both of them are in Revelation 5. I'll let you look it up when you get home. I won't read the passages. But he is viewed as the Lamb of God and in other one he is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Have you ever seen a lion like lamb? Jesus is both. So the second way to neuter the apocalyptic vision is to neuter the lambishness of the lamb. And we have many people in parts of the world who have come to the conclusion that Jesus did not die for our sins. The substitutionary atonement is a function of paganism. And in fact, some in the emerging church say that crucifying Jesus on the cross was divine child abuse. And with those strokes, they joined the camp of the Protestant liberals in the 1920s. Everywhere in the apocalypse that Jesus is victorious, it's on the basis of the lamb that was slain. He died in my place. He died in your place. So that we could be victorious. So if we're new to the Lamb, we've got problems. But if we've only got the Lamb, we've only got half the Gospel. Jesus died, but the suffering continues on and on and on. Babies die, good people get ill, all of us suffer in one way or another. Yes, the lamb is crucial, but if you've only got the lamb of God, you've only got half a gospel. The other half is the lion of the tribe of Judah. They come together in that unlikely phrase, the wrath of the lamb, in Revelation 6, 16. That's a bad word, wrath. Theologians don't like to talk about it, but you know, it's very popular in the Bible. George claims it's used in the Bible 580 times, the wrath of God. God's wrath is a function of his love. He no longer wants to see the suffering go on and on and on. He's tired of Hiroshima's and Iraq's and Rwanda's. God will come as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He'll put an end to this mess. That's the wrath of the lamb. Without that second aspect of Jesus, you don't have a full gospel. Jesus is coming again. He's the lamb and he's the lion. Adventists must teach the lamb of God and the lion of the tribe of Judah. As Seventh-day Adventists, we're not called to teach a gospel of respectability, but pro proclaim a message of the lamb and the lion. It's a serious message, which brings me to one final word, one last word that we don't like. And it's in the next slide. See that word there? Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Fear. Now I know that you know that it means respect and reverence. And so it does. But it also means fear in the sense of being afraid. God will not forever tolerate the sinful rebellious attitudes and the actions of a world that rebels against him and destroys. It means fear in the sense of those who call upon the mountains or the rocks to fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, from the wrath of the land, from the great day of his wrath. Who can stand before it? That's the kind of fear. God has a message for us to wake up. Don't neuter the lion. When God comes, he's going to finish this mess. 
And perhaps a real problem in fearing God is that too many modern Christians have neutered the biblical concept of sin. We have forgotten the thundering proclamations of the Apostle Paul that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death. A neutered understanding of sin leads to a neutered lamb and a neutered lion and all put together they add up to neutered preaching and religious meaningless. The book of Revelation is actually a wake-up call. A wake-up call to both the world at large and to Adventists. It's a call to put away the casual attitude towards God and the issues of the great controversy. For too long we have probably sought to make God into a nice 21st century gentleman of the order of an Adventist intellectual or a kindly physician, not to put physicians down. For too long we have thought of God as a toothless old grandfather or a figment of Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories where all who are kind and good get eternal confectionery. The apocalypse of John is a call to Seventh-day Adventists to wake up not only to the beauty of the last book of the Bible but to its power and its forcefulness to its meaning for our day. God bless. Dear Father, we are so glad that we have Jesus, who is the light and joy of our life. Please keep us true and faithful. Give us a fresh vision of him in the apocalypse, that we may love him and serve him, that we may stand for something, that we may be as politically incorrect as he was, just like him. Please lead us to you, lead us to those who want to know about you, that we may encourage them also to choose Jesus and to enjoy eternal life with us. We look forward to that day when we see you face to face and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.